couple of seconds. Sure. Let me get you back over here. So we are live at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday, which is rare for me. Yeah, I'm not a night person. <laughs> but Nina's in Hawaii, of all places. Goodness, set six hours? You know yep, what I, mean? I sure appreciate your evening uh, <laughs> live stream accommodation. Yes. <laughs> accommodation, exactly. Yeah, because it's well, 1 p.m. here. Oh my gosh. You just had yeah. lunch. Yes. <laughs> so Nina is the owner of Heart Health Care Solutions. I'm actually going to, I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, and Nina and my, both our backgrounds are in skilled home health care. So I was really happy when I met you. We certainly had a ton in common and so yep. much to talk about. And one of, the, one of the things that we really had in common was when we started talking about the Quapi program. So Quapi really stems from the skilled world, but it's trickling into the non-medical home care. And I think it's brilliant. And I'm so excited to actually bring it to uh, people in my community because it can benefit them in so many different ways. Absolutely. So Quapi, let's start with Quapi. What sure. does it actually stand for? I mean, I, so many people have no idea what it is, and it's yeah. just so huge. It's intimidating. Quapi it is, isn't it? Is like the unknown. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to right? be. Right. <laughs> so Quapi stands for quality assurance or quality assessment. So yeah. it can go either way. So for the skilled, uh, skilled nursing world versus hospice and home care and private duty um, and performance improvement. And for non-skilled um, private duty home care, it's usually just referred to as PI. So performance improvement program. So you you can see it uh, different ways. QA, PI, QA, PI. They're all the same thing. Mm -hmm. I remember when I had my Medicare skilled company and I was trying to figure out all the committees and the PAC committees, which they don't have anymore, I guess. Right. Because you're an ACHC surveyor. So they don't have PAC anymore. Right. That's not, not a requirement. That I know. of. Yeah. I don't think they do. When I was trying to learn how they all fit together. Yeah. And Quapi was one. And when I had my business, it was PI. But it was kind of, it must have been like transitioning because it wasn't what my consultant told me. So it took me forever to figure it out. So it's QAPI. Is yeah. it still, and it's still referred to sometimes as just PI? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For okay. private duty, it's um, at least as far as ACHC is concerned, okay. they just have PI program activities. Um, so the quality assessment or quality assurance piece seems like it is still niched to more skilled care services. But it's definitely trickling into home care. And it I is. yeah, non-medical. And I I feel like it's because um, the non-medical non-medical home care can now bill like Medicare Advantage. Yes. And when you start billing insurance, it's more regulated and yep. they want to see how home care companies are keeping their clients and patients out of the hospital. That's what it all Absolutely. comes down to. Absolutely. And how do they do that? Part of you the have Medicare to, quality. Right. Program. And you have to figure out how to quantify the quality care that you're providing. How in the Absolutely. world do you put a number on that? That's yeah. where coffee comes in. It's really exciting. I'm such yes. a nerd, but it's so it exciting. It is very awesome. exciting. And I think I love it. a lot of people are intimidated by it because it does seem like a lot of moving pieces. And even if you look at the SNF super easy CMS checklist, it has 12 steps and really there's like 25 on there. And you're like, oh my gosh, this yeah. is so much stuff, but it doesn't have to be that confusing or involved. Right. It truly is a very simple concept to come to um, where you have areas for quality improvement. So. so you and I talked earlier, the difference between like the skilled and non-medical when it comes to tracking um, incidents versus indicators. Yes. So for skilled, they track what? What would be an indicator? So an indicator can be an incident. So okay. an incident is something that you record because it's out of the norm. So um, a fall, a skin tear, a, a diversion of a medication or a medication error. You, you don't anticipate 
on a day-to-day -day basis that you would have medication errors or patients becoming injured. So anytime that happens, that's out of the baseline. So that's when that's an incident. Whereas an indicator would be an indicator of the level of care or quality of care that they're receiving. So an indicator could be false, um, but a fall is also an incident. So hopefully that's right. not too gray. But a lot of indicators are, are clinical in nature. So it could be falls, it could be rehospitalizations, it could right. be, um, an indicator can be a lot of different things. Um, so for a non-medical home care company, what do you think would be one of their, it would be an incident that happens when one of their caregivers are taking care of a client? So an incident could be anything reported by the family or caregiver, or um, even sometimes the physician's office will call the agency and say, hey, my patient said that your sitter uh, stole all their medications. Well, that's an incident right there. You want to <laughs> want to investigate that and document it because even aside from uh, accreditation or aside from Medicare, you could have the police involved in that right. and you want to show um, or you could have litigation if, if a negative outcome occurred because of that incident. So you want to say, we took this seriously. We suspended the staff member. We followed these steps. You know, we, we interviewed everyone involved here. You know, we drug tested maybe, you know, so there are, it's a gamut of different things that you might do for a different type of incident, but pretty much anywhere in healthcare that you work, you're going to have incidents that happen and you're like, where did this come from? How did this happen? But there's always going to be things that we don't plan for with patients. Sure. And those are the incidents. <laughs> and then how does that relate to Quapi? Because they'll take that and track it, right? And that's where they yeah. get their quantitative number. Yes. So um, there's lots of different things you can track for your Quapi. And most of those things are things that you want to follow to show that they have improved. So if an indicator is low or high, maybe you return to hospital rates, let's say, and your benchmark is 18%, which is a kind of a hospice uh, norm, you want to stay under 18% for unplanned return to hospitals. Um, so that could be an indicator you track. Maybe yours are 25% or 28%. And you're like, man, this is high, and it looks bad, and we can't market this. And our, you know, our physician partners or our community um, referral partners are saying, you know, a lot of your patients are ending back up in the hospital and we, right. you know, we want to know why, or we want you to speak to that. And that's where your Quapi program is going to come in. You're going to say, actually, you know, we've been tracking this and we're finding these things. And so this is what we've put in place um, to prevent that. And so you can actually use Quapi as a marketing tool right. to say, um, here's where our rates are and here's where everybody else's are. Like we have rehospitalizations mm -hmm. at 10%. Um, and so it just kind of brings everybody's focus to the same initiative. So if you have an area that's really impacting the quality of your care or the satisfaction of your referral sources or your clients, that's probably going to be one of the first areas mm -hmm. you look at for your performance improvement plan. And what if nobody else has one, like no other non-medical in your community and you're taking it into a nursing home and talking to the DON yeah. or the social worker. It's or a huge selling point. Hospital if you can get into them, but yeah, you know, I had yeah. never had any luck getting into the case right. managers. But it's a huge selling point for for it um, really is. And if you have a lot of data apart in a competitive market, yeah, yeah. So you yeah. have a lot of data. You can actually do graphs and say, look, we identified this, and look how much we've improved in six months or a year. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's brilliant for marketing. I really do. So for a Quapi, is it quarterly meetings? So, so they put a committee together, from what I recall. Um, I know for ACHC, probably for CHAP2, um, I mean, we always did quarterly meetings because, well, you just don't want to miss one. <laughs> but I don't know if it's actually required requirement. every quarter. Okay. No, it's you. Um, yeah. I think that there, it depends on which area of specialty you're in and what you're tracking. You have to have a frequency that you're monitoring. Okay. So you have to have identified how often you're going to be monitoring these outcomes. And that's part of their policy. Yep. Wouldn't it be? Yep. So they'd have a, uh, a QAPI plan or a policy, which is 
kind of the same thing as a policy. This is what we're yeah. going to do for our co-op right. program. Policy, plan, very similar. And that's going to include um, kind of who should be involved. And they're all very generic. And honestly, you can find them on CMS um, websites as well. But if you're going for accreditation or if a surveyor of any kind, state, federal, came for a complaint survey and asked you for your QAPI plan, if you hand them the CMS worksheet that's not at all tailored to your agency, they're not going to accept that. The whole yeah. point of a QAPI plan is that it's tailored to your agency's needs, your areas of quality. So um, you don't want that to be the generic True. Um, worksheet on the CMS website. Yeah, because that's telling your story, basically. Yeah. Yep. And how they're, what the plan is to make sure that they're keeping clients and patients out of the hospital. So we were talking about um, non-medical and accreditation. So I'm curious, why would a non-medical want to go through an accreditation process? I did it as a Medicare skill home care com or home health, and it was very difficult. Yes. 10 years off my life, probably. Yep. Um, so why would they want to do that? And is well, it as intense? Is it as intense as this, when you're billing Medicare? Med I'm talking um, about traditional Medicare provider number, Medicare. That depends. So they're as intense. Um, I would say no. An accreditation survey is less intense from my personal experience and from the experiences of um, those companies that I've worked with, um, but it's a different kind of intensity. The accreditation requires so many more moving pieces. So they're going to require you to do things that CMS um, standards of participation or Medicare standards don't require. Um, and, and that is the accreditation piece because you are setting yourself aside. You are saying like, we, we're reaching this higher bar with, our, mm -hmm. with um, what we meet. And so um, that does require a lot more um, work on the part of the organization. For sure. Yes. So, but as far as intensity, when you're working with an accrediting body or an accrediting organization like ACHC or CHAP, I'm, I'm a certified consultant for both. So when you're, uh, and then there's also JCO, so Joint Commission. Yeah. So those are the three main accrediting bodies. When you're working with an accrediting body, you're paying them for their service. So there is a little bit more of a partnership approach there. Um, for the most part, they will allow you to correct uh, accreditation specific deficiencies on site. So you don't have to do a plan of correction for those specific areas. So um, the approach is less punitive in my experience that they're not there to shame you and say, why aren't you meeting these standards? They're more like come alongside you like, okay, in order to be accredited, Here's what we need to see. Can you show any, you know, anything that you've done um, to meet that? Okay, if not, then here's what we would like to see. Can we put this in place, or, um, you know, can we um, add this, update your policy with this? Um, so they'll they'll um, make more suggestions in my experience than a surveyor, especially a federal surveyor who is there to prove um, a point. Whatever that point may be, it may be a complaint survey. They they may be there to validate or you know yeah. invalidate a complaint uh, right. that you are fraudulent or um, you know not providing good care. And so and it only takes one complaint, right? Right. Yeah. So um, right. the accreditation process is more like to reach a higher standard and less like to find what's wrong. And I'm not saying that all surveyors have a punitive approach. I've had some very good surveyors who truly were just passionate about, um, you know, helping people provide better quality. But I've also had a lot of surveyors who were there to prove a point that you're not meeting a standard. And that's one of those. Yeah. yeah and they're no fun. fun. No. They're no fun. <laughs> so not at all. Uh, I don't believe that the surveyors uh, from the accrediting bodies that I none of them that I've dealt with have had that approach just because yeah. they realize they're an extra layer. Yeah. So um, that's the mindset. It's totally different mindset. Gotcha. Um, so it's beneficial for any agency to do. Hmm. <laughs> well, well, I guess everybody will be the judge of that. <laughs> yes. 
It's tough. Yes, I'd be interested to hear from, yeah. from those, those who may have done it. I mean, I've talked to a lot of my clients and there are a lot of non-medical that have actually gone through it. It's very brave, I think. <laughs> it's know. definitely more uh, gaining popularity because it does kind of exempt you yes. for the vast majority from a federal or state survey. So yeah, if you're accredited, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you know your state surveyors and they're not enjoyable people to spend time with every year or every three years, yeah. um, that's motivational to become accredited in itself. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I know, you know, um, it's gaining in popularity for sure. Um, so you and it work looks with like, I'm oh, sorry about 10% um, get a validation survey or less. So for um, non-medical home care for yeah. in general, even oh, for, really? for hospice, home health or private duty wow. um, in general, it looks like about a 10% validation survey but is you, what CMS shoots for. Hmm. Well, I know through so, trying to bill, get a, get a Medicare provider number, you don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. You have to go through it. Um, well, you can do initial certification. Really? Yeah, you can do initial certification with ACHC um, or CHAP. And like okay. I said, my my knowledge about uh, Joint Commission is much more limited than than the other two who I'm a certified consultant for. So okay. So back to Coapi. So they get a policy. They have to get mm -hmm. their policy in place. Yep. Put their plan together uh, for non medical. Start tracking incidents versus skilled that tracks indicators. <laughs> I think I got that right. They but, can really, they can really can be the other either. Yeah. They just okay. need to have, it's not, um, as specific for non-medical. So okay. for home health or hospice, their, um, requirements are a little more specific. So they're required to have a PI coordinator. So some one person designated to manage their PI and do an annual summary of what the program activities are. Um, and that person generally keeps the minutes and keeps track of right. what what plan they're working. Um, so the um, home health and hospice um, accreditation guidelines for QAPI are a little more clear um, and a little more um, high level as with their requirements as far as what they require for QAPI. I was looking at some of the comments. Everyone who's watching feel free to ask questions because Nina has a lot of knowledge. So Sonia said, I'm used to surveyors who provide coaching. That's good. I mean, that's really amazing because I did not have that experience. I wish I had you as my surveyor. That is good. <laughs> really good. That's great, Sonia. Anybody else have any questions, please go ahead and chime in. So you had something to share, didn't you? Like a something, what do you want to share? Sure, absolutely. Um, I can share. I have a couple different things. I have a um, checklist here. Let me open it up if it'll let me. So basically, this is a um, checklist that shows all the requirements for um, a QAPI program. So if you can see that, there's a PI program checklist. Can you, is that a good size, Robin? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. So these are the requirements. Um, this is more specifically for um, ACHC, home health, and hospice. So um, like I said, for the PI areas, if it says PI, um, those are more of the private duty um, guidelines because they don't really require it to be a QAPI specific um, plan. It's more of a performance improvement program that they require. You still have to have a policy and a plan. Um, you still have to have evidence that the whole staff is involved. So um, surveyors, I even put a little tip at the bottom here, a surveyor is probably gonna ask, how are you involved um, in the yeah. PI program? And they're gonna, that's a really common staff question and then what is one initiative your agency's working on? Um, what would the answer be there, that. Nina? So any staff, so the, so the, uh, the answer for staff 
any staff should be able to say, well, if I see something that impacts patient quality, I report it. So I report incidents, complaints, grievances, satisfaction issues, family concerns, um, medication errors, abuse, fraud. I know, I, you know, in my orientation process, in my videos, I was trained that if I see something, I'm to report that. So um, along That's the same lines of compliance. Okay. Um, and then what is one agency, uh, one PI initiative your agency is working on? They ask that a lot. The surveyors ask that a lot. Um, and that would just be specific. You'd want to share after your QAPI meeting. You could um, share that with staff at an all staff meeting or at your IDG, IDT meeting um, and say, hey, I just wanted to review the minutes from our last QAPI meeting with everyone. And here's one area we're really looking at closely. And here's what we've been finding. Here's how you can help. Um, here's the interventions we put in place. So it's really kind of um, a good tool for transparency because sometimes as leaders, we stew on those things ourselves and we're really worried about them. Like, yeah. why do we have so many falls or why do we have so many med errors? And we can't figure it out because yeah. we haven't shared it with our staff. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people will have an aide or a, um, a UAP, an unlicensed assistive personnel, like a sitter or a caregiver or a volunteer, sit in those meetings. And surveyors absolutely just love that um, <laughs> because they bring a totally different perspective. Right. So um, I have a quick question. Sonia sure. is asking, can you see that? Yes, I can. Hi, Sonia. So PI is mostly for non-medical. So it's a little bit confusing the way they kind of word it. <laughs> like QAPI, Q-A-P-I. The PI stands for performance improvement. So the quality assurance part is expected for Medicare and um, Medicaid. You're expected to have that QAPI program. So I think the PI part for private duty, non-medical, it, it just leaves that quality assessment or quality assurance piece off and just says you need to have continuous performance improvement. Uh, to me, it's kind of splitting hairs because it's the same concept. You're still going to yeah. be looking at the areas where you're not meeting quality or you're um, seeing a um, lack of consistency in your performance as an right. agency. And you're still going to be putting the same plan in place. You're still going to be involving your whole team. You're still going to be discussing those areas. You're still going to have a set frequency. So it's very, it's so similar that, you know, the only reason I can think that they left the QA part off is because if you're not a Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid certified provider that, you know, maybe that piece doesn't apply. But it's really, I mean, copy is for everybody. Quappy is that, for everyone. That's a good slogan. <laughs> yes, it is. You need Quappy. Oh Quappy is for everybody. Quappy is for everybody. Yes. Yeah, it is. It's so important. And it's so useful. That's the thing. It is. I mean, it's, it's all about taking opening. care of the clients and yeah. the patients. And you want to do the best you possibly can. And that's what the surveyors are always going to ask. What are you doing? Like, tell me how, what are you doing? What kind of, how are you providing quality care for your clients and your patients? So the what a great way to be able that. to explain it. Exactly. The other benefit to that that I have found, and I would encourage people to use this, is when you have that performance improvement plan already prepared from your QAPI initiatives or your PI initiatives, if and when you are surveyed and that comes up as a deficiency, they look back, you know, six months, nine months, and they say, well, we noticed that... Um, you uh, didn't have orders or didn't have a care plan update or didn't have something that's expected, um, especially for accreditation, you can bring that PIP or, and use that as your plan of correction and say, we identified this as a QAPI team. We put in place this intervention and um, you know we haven't seen this as a trend for the next six months. We resolved that three months ago. We've audited, we have reviewed 10% of our patients We've reviewed 10% of the orders for the last three months, and we haven't found that that occurred again. And I have seen that to be effective in avoiding that deficiency. Is it 100%? No. You could still get a tag for that, and they just accept that as your plan of correction. Like wow. I said, depends on the surveyor, depends on the situation, depends on the tag. But I have seen 
um, in both home care and skilled nursing facilities, that they will take that Coapi PIP as a on-site plan of correction at times. So when you say Coapi PIP, is that, are they looking at the minutes, like the notes from your quarterly meetings or from whatever your policy kind says, of. how often you're going to have your meetings? So a PIP is just a performance improvement plan. So when okay. you identify that indicator that you're going to track and you say, we're going to track rehospitalizations, um, you can put that on a performance improvement plan and I can pull one up in that, uh, in the Quapi pack and show you if you like. Yeah. Um, there is a template in here for that um, and say, okay, this is what we decided we're going to follow. Um, we're going to do this, work on this area as a team. Let's see if it'll let me open it. Okay. <laughs> see that? Let's find the PIP. Okay, so we've got this Tim PIP template in here. It's very simple. You could make this on your own. You de definitely don't need one of these. Uh, that's it, There's nothing special about this at all. It has the issue. It has, so that's going to be, the issue is our rehospitalizations were 25% for August. It has the discussion we met our at our Quapi meeting on this date, or we had an ad hoc meeting at our IDT about and reviewed all the patients in August that were um, rehospitalized hospitalized unplanned. So is that the in action? here? Do what? Is that in what we're looking at? Can you see the PIP? I slide? see it just says downloads. Can you no. actually? It's oh. not doing that. Sorry. I didn't realize that. <laughs> well, I just see, good, I see boxes. So that's a good, good to know. Thank you. It is not <laughs> the correct screen. Let's try that again. Sonia has uh, a question while you're looking. Sure. So she's asking, how do you pick your benchmarks? That's a great question. Honestly, there's a lot of flexibility there because you can um, go by what's Painting you the most at that time. Um, you can go by um, something that keeps coming up. You can go by something you got a deficiency on or you're afraid you will get a deficiency on. You can go by something that's flagging if you do admission audits or if you're a home care, let's say you're home health and you do OASIS audits and you are having one area that is consistently flagging or you're a hospice and you have HIS and you have one area that is consistently getting answered incorrectly um, patient satisfaction surveys are a great area. Yeah. And I don't know why it is not letting me, I'm sorry. It's not letting me share this, uh, PowerPoint tab. I don't know okay. what that's about. Um, okay. but so, um, you could pick from anything your staff or is that, did that work? Oh, let me see. Let me see. I tried one more time. No, no. Oh, wait. No. Oh, no. <laughs> I turn that off. I give up. It, yeah. Sorry. No. So um, you could also do something that your staff keep bringing up as an issue to you. Like um, if you have just a pain point with new, when you bring on a new client and you're like, um, you know, we keep having the same problem that they don't know who to call when something happens and they call 911. So she's you know, asking, so she can pick her own. And yeah, she should yeah. pick her own, right? Because only she knows what's yes, happening in her yes. business. Yeah. Yes. They want to see that you are identifying the areas in your business um, that are not meeting benchmarks. So it's kind of like they want to see that you know what's a problem. Right. Um, and how you're and fixing that you're it. aware of what's not going well. Um, yeah. so, you know, kind of as you review your operations, those areas that stick out kind of as a pain point to you might be a good, might be a good start. Um, and you know, you don't have to do them all at once. I wouldn't yeah. try. So well, and it's a good way to, I mean, we would figure out what was going on out in the field and then actually have our monthly meet our staff meetings would we have an in-service on that yeah, yep. issue. And then yeah, that would and go you into can our document that on a PI plan. Exactly. Yep. yep. Um, 
And the PI plan that I was pulling up just literally had a column for the issue, a column for the discussion, a column for the action you're going to take, and a column okay. for revisiting the, was it effective? And that's what they want to see. They want to see that you revisited the plan. Was it effective? Yes. Tracking and trending. So you're going to, if you do audits, those are great to, a tool to use to see what areas you're not meeting benchmark in. Um, and maybe your benchmark is 90% compliance on a certain area for audits. And you keep doing that audit until you reach that 90%. And if it doesn't work, you change the plan and kind of start again. Okay. Good stuff, Nina. Love it. That's great. I'm kind of, I've got the guidelines pulled up in front of me just so I'm making sure I'm giving uh, <laughs> the 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 information. The, Yes, I'm accurate information. And when you ask a question, I'm just kind of verifying that there's nothing else uh, in the manual about that for the standards. So uh, if you see me looking down, that's what I'm looking at. <laughs> at the, uh, survey standards. So if you're in Hawaii, do you actually fly over and do surveys for ACHC and CHAP? Um, no. So I do. I am an accredited consultant for them. So basically I help, I partner with organizations who want to either transfer accrediting bodies from ACHC to CHAP or from, um, you know, Ch JCO to CHAP or mm -hmm. vice versa. So I partner with them to make sure that they're successful with that. So I will oh, okay. help put their co plan in place uh, so that they meet right. the standards. Um, and then um, you know, I also help new, new accreditations uh, as well. So C so if they're being surveyed by CMS or their state, I'll also help them prepare, um, at whatever level help they need for, for that accreditation survey. And we for, can talk in a minute sure about, about you. I think you have a package that, because non-medical home care companies, a lot of them can't afford what a skilled nursing facility could afford to hire you as a consultant. Sure. Right. But you did Absolutely. do something together. Yes, I did. Purchase. And that's okay. what I was uh, looking at earlier. If you oh. saw that um, tab that I pulled up when it did work. So this uh, right here is just a copy pack for home care. And it is literally a packet of downloads that is everything okay. you need to start your own copy program. So it has all these downloads and what these are. There's a copy meeting template. You don't oh, have to perfect. make one. There's your PI plan, copy policy. Obviously, you're going to want to download and review all these documents. And when you do, it'll pull up a document that you can edit to make sure it's your own. So there are some external resources like you and I had looked at, Robin, the five elements, a goal setting worksheet, um, the hospice toolkit, a copy self-assessment tool. And then what I was referring to from the CMS website is this sample copy program plan. And that's yeah. great to have to reference. Right. But you don't want to hand them that. You want to okay. hand them a like you know what you're doing kind of and document, a copy plan <laughs> that has your agency's name on it right. um, and matches, you know, your policies and procedures. But the best thing about this pack here is I already included your rehospitalizations tracking log, a conducting uh, investigations checklist, PI activity form, um, PI activity chart. Fall interventions, infection log, um, that can be used for staff or um, okay. patient Clients infections, mm -hmm. uh, an incident log, a complaint log, a very simple incident checklist on what you should do if an incident occurs, um, and then a PIP template that you can use to um, record your own PIP projects. So this pack kind of checks all of the boxes um, for qu a QAPI program for home care, whether it be um, skilled non or not medical or non-medical. So the way and they would, so. the way it would work, like logistically, so they mm -hmm. know um, you have the logs, you track things that happen throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, we did it every quarter, but you said there's no, there's no regulation or standard on that. It's easiest I have found, and this is just from me being in the director role of a hospice location, um, when things would happen myself or you don't have to be medical or a nurse to track something right. on a log. 
anyone, the person who answers your phones can do this. And that's where the information so, comes from. People calling yes. in, doctor's offices saying, right. this is what so we're hearing. Be, yep, it could be from a phone call, it could be from a email survey, it could be from uh, okay. um, a nurse report, if you do have nurses. Um, so, but the person taking down the information isn't the person doing the assessment of the patient. They're just recording that the event happened. Anyone okay. can do that. So you're going to record on a log that this was reported. Okay. And I would do that in real time because when you go back, mm -hmm. you lose a lot. Yeah. So yeah. you really want to do the complaints piece and um, the incidents piece specifically in real time so that you can really do a little bit of drill down on why this actually occurred. Okay. Um, so they have their log. They are entering the information as it comes in real mm -hmm. time. Yep. At their Quapi committee meetings is where that's discussed, right? They pull the yes. logs. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's discussed. So they see what's happening out there and yeah. that's what they track. Yep. Okay. So they're going to look at that um, fall log for, okay, so this is September. So we'll look at the fall log for August and we'll say, okay, well, we had, you know, Mr. Smith fell four times and he's at home and um, maybe he needs a therapy eval or re-eval, or maybe he needs a home assessment for safety. Um, or do we have a process in place for when patients fall to see what the root cause is? Does a nurse or, or um, does a, a therapist go out and do an assessment? How do we handle that when that does happen? And if so they're non-medical, what a great marketing tool to have yes. that relationship with a home health care company yes. because they don't provide that. Right. But they can yep. certainly, you know, share referrals that way. Right. And, and even if they don't, um, yes, that is a great point. And even if they don't have nursing care, um, you know, if a patient falls, you want to have your staff trained to know, do I call 911 over this? Right. Do I, what do I do when a patient falls? So that right there could be a benchmark that you identify, like we had three falls and they didn't know what to do. So that right there is an opportunity for quality. And that's okay. Like, it's, and that's okay. It goes against yeah. like everything in your brain to say, I am not yeah. admitting this. <laughs> right. Yes. But you know, you have to have something to track yes. and we do want to take care of our clients and patients. So Mo asks, are there averages for common benchmarks that can be used for as guides? Yes. So you mean averages as like a far, as far as percentages? That really varies. So that varies by the um, state or by the type of location you are. So like for, um, I don't know very many, but like for hospice, I know for sure 18% <laughs> is the hospital rehospitalization rate because mm -hmm. I was held to that on a pretty routine basis. Like, yeah. you know, hey, you got 17% this month and you're like, yes. Uh -huh. But, you know, I think what you're looking for more than anything is trends. Yeah. So if you're looking for, um, infections. I don't, I think that, um, it can be very easy to overcomplicate this. And this is why, like, I get really frustrated when I look at the CMS site because they're like, take the denominator divided by the numerator, oh multiply gosh. by a hundred and subtract the amount of kids you have. Like who, you know, it's just, <laughs> like, it's just, it's yes. very confusing. So yeah. I would say to keep it simple, just establish a baseline trend. So start looking at month over month, what your average is. And then if you have three months that you have 10% of infections and one month you have 35, is mm -hmm. that flu season? Can you rule that out? Then I probably wouldn't maybe do a PIP for that. Did you have, um, you know, a new employee or a agency temporary employee, and maybe they didn't follow your infection control standards or they didn't know, or maybe you're, you have a shortage on PPE or need to do a refresher on your infection control processes. You can look at those type of things to see like where that variance is coming from as opposed to like what number we're supposed to be at. You could, you could definitely, um, look and see if there are any specific common benchmarks for guides. But normally I say go by your agency's norm um, for a three month period, you know, get three months of information and then reevaluate that. Um, that way it's not 
because it's not as clear cut. Um, and I think that um, for hospice and home health, there are some like HIS and OASIS guidelines you can follow. Um, but I'm, but for non-medical, you're kind of anything you do is, is above and beyond at this yeah. point, I think, you know, but so I think it's changing. So I just, I agree. Like, like now is the time to really bring this to the community of non-medical and really teach them about copy, teach them about how to track and to be able to get those numbers and to know how to, you know, quantify what you're doing because it's going to happen. I yes, mean, it is. I agree. Yeah. Insurance the standard okay. says the the agency identifies acceptable limits of thresholds and findings. So that's what the actual guidelines from ACHC says on what your benchmark is. Ah. It says that you determine what's acceptable for your agency. So I would take, you know, just kind of look at what your audits that you're currently doing, if any, or what information you can pull from easily. Um, what documentation you have to say, okay, this is pretty average for us, and then base those thresholds on that. Hopefully, that like answered it. the question. Um, yeah, I mean, and they I only think have to have really, one. really, huh? They only have to have one. They only have to have one oh. PI plan. Yeah, for the um, private duty. Oh. So they just have to be working one area. So. Huh. Although I am queen overachiever and want to do them all, I would discourage you from being like me and just pick one area that you could show you're okay. really focusing on quality for. That's great. And then you don't have to. Yeah. So they need to have one PI activity um, for um, including, this says uh, one PI activity must include an assessment of possible risk factors. So that's infections and communicable diseases. Okay. Hopefully I didn't just skip. Um, and then you also want to have, I have a dumb question. Communicable diseases would be what <laughs> is that? So any, any OSHA standard bloodborne pathogen or otherwise is a communicable disease that could go from one person to another. So that is a, a complicated way of saying that, but any type of OSHA training that you would have in your um, beautiful orientation video platform, offer. you Call would. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I know what's in there. Those are great. Oh, it's so in there. You could, yep, it's in there. So one PI activity related to OSHA bloodborne pathogens, infections, or communicable diseases, one PI activity on um, a service you provide, and one PI activity on administration. So one on each of those three areas. You know, so administration nice because, would be oh, I'm sorry. like your staffing. Staffing? Yeah. So if you have, uh, or, or it could be your education. Ah. Uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I know people look at Quapi and it can be really intimidating, but it's really it not. I mean, we just, we basically just laid the whole thing out. So mm -hmm. you, you have your policy, which you have all this stuff. I don't know how much it is, but you're welcome to share that if you want. Um, but you have your policy. You yeah. track your indicators or uh, incidents. Um, you log everything that's coming in. And I guess the report really comes from the minutes that mm -hmm. you take from your Quapi committee meetings. So you're going to compile before the meeting whatever areas you review. So if you're a hospice, you're probably going to review in your QAPI um, maybe your pain indicator from your surveys, um, from your CAPS surveys. So you're going to look at pain. So you're going to look at your rehospitalizations are within that hospice 18 or less area. Um, you know, and then you could look at other things like frequencies if you're a hospice. Okay, our frequency orders don't match the Medicare weeks. And so we missed a frequency. We said we were going to see them twice a week and we only saw them once. So that's a deviation. Um, so that's something you can, you can look at. So you're going to take all those areas that you look at and kind of compile that to review in your QAPI meetings. So you're going to say infections for this quarter were a total of three 
infections for last quarter reported were a total of five. Um, and you can kind of determine your trends based on that. Okay. Say, and they only have to pick one. So that could be one. That could be one, one infection. Right? Yeah, one infection area, one administrative area, and one care area. So the care area for hospice could be pain. The care area for, um, you know, home health could be even ADL decline. You know. Oh, um, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So there, you can pick. There's a gamut of areas you can you can choose from. So. Monica, she said she couldn't open the worksheet. Monica, if you can DM me on Facebook, I'm happy to actually send me your email because we have a lot of information that's going to be going out. And then Mike, my buddy, Mike Nally. So he's coming in, I think a little bit late because we talked about sure. this earlier, but our hospital readmissions involved in Quapi. It's that's what Quapi is all about. <laughs> It, I think, can right? be, it can be yeah. part of your quality indicators. So if that's something that, um, you know, like for hospice it is, and I, I believe for home health, they also follow um, unplanned rehospitalizations. I know skilled nursing facilities do um, because it's that they even get dinged for um, their rehospitalization rates in skilled nursing facilities. Um, so that's definitely always going to be an area of focus. Whether you make that part of your QAPI meeting or not, it's kind of up to you. Yeah. It's not required. There's no requirement that says you must include hospitalizations in your QAPI um, that I've seen. I Someone could certainly correct me on that, but in the, in the guidelines that I've reviewed for hospice, home health, or private duty, there has not been anything that has said you have to track rehospitalizations. Um, you could track that as your care initiative. Yeah. So you could use that as your service, your care or service initiative is to say rehospitalizations. Um, and that's an easy one to track because, um, you know, usually it's a lag measure that you're following after it happens. You're going right. back and you're auditing. Trying to find them. <laughs> you're going back and auditing how many times this happened last month. And then you're, you're, plan is kind of the lead measure, like what we're going to do to prevent that from happening. Maybe we get therapy in there earlier. Maybe we do an admission call um, from someone, you know, at the office checks in with that patient um, the same day and the following day at admission and says, how are you feeling? Any symptoms to report? Do we, have you talked to your doctor, you know, or yeah. has a little checklist they go through with all new admissions? Do you know who to call if something happens? Or, you know, do you have all the supplies you need? whatever those things are that you've identified from those past audits as a reason that that person reported going to the hospital, if you can get that information, sometimes that's challenging to get that information. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes we don't even find out they're in the hospital until several days later, you know, truly. Yeah, which is a problem. <laughs> it is. And that's why that's usually kind of that lag measure where you're looking back in time, um, trying to make changes. Um, but just taking any information that you have and compiling that to see if there's a trend. So I have this text. I'm trying to figure out if he wants me to ask you or not. Let me see, okay. just read it really quick. Sure. I don't know. Dave, can you sign on? I don't know if you want me to ask for this or, or if you're asking me personally. <laughs> I don't want to ask you if, it, if he doesn't want me to like go public with it. So Dave, if you're watching, you should be able to ask in the question. Okay. Anyway, I'll catch up with him later, unless we see him chime in. So ACHC defines an incident as an adverse event. So that would be an unexpected death, suicide, act of violence, serious injury, adverse drug reaction, medication error, or other undesirable, unplanned outcome. So um, any client, patient, witnessed or unwitnessed injury, including falls, skin tears and other injuries, um, or any um, area in compliance with the FDA's medical device tracking. So if they were injured on a piece of equipment, um, like the Hoyer lift broke yeah. and they hit their head, um, those type of things are all incidents. So those, any adverse event is what you wanna be tracking on an incident log. Okay. Oh, he doesn't have Facebook. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't even know we're here. Oh, well, I'll call him later. So do you have that um, 
floppy questionnaire that you were showing me earlier? I don't know if it was going to work. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, oh, yeah. Where we were kind of going to test. Yeah, let's test everybody and see how All much right, they learn. All right. Well, if they want, if the, if you got a fun crowd, we'll we'll see if. Well, I know we, Mike's we going to answer. I know Sonia everything. will answer. Let's see who else. Okay. Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Terry. All right. Come on, everybody. You got to cool. answer Nina's question. She could so be we'll your surveyor one day. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Okay. So let's go. I'll share this real okay. quick. Let's see, hopefully this will work. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we'll why. see. I'm not having ahead. much luck with share screen apparently. So I'm going to share this right here. Okay. So it. this QR code you can scan with your phone, or you can go to www.doodoo.vote and enter the code for our survey or our poll which is five uh, F8A71EC. So you can either scan the so QR code. I know, it's it's like a <laughs> little fun code. game. So the questions, I, I don't even remember, I don't remember what the, all the questions are, but well, hopefully they won't be too hard. So I'll give everybody just a second to either yeah. scan the QR code or go to www.dovote and enter that little code. I used to have a barcode on my phone. I think if you just put your camera over it, if you have an oh, iPhone, okay. sure, just hold your camera over that code oh, and it'll pull it right up for you. Get you don't out. even have to do anything. Oh gosh, that's it. Yeah. That's so now you know I how to do QR that. codes. You don't Thank have to you. have anything special. Let's see if it comes up now. Okay. Loading your poll. Nina, this is so cool. Yeah. I'm do this again. Okay. Ready? Are I we ready it. to go to the first one? All right, everybody do that. Just put your phone up to it. Yeah, put your phone up too. If you need it, you can always enter it at the top of the, it's on the top of every question. Oh, okay. So it's going to let you pick your response. Oh, somebody already answered. What? So Quapi means. Oh my gosh. They're so fast. I haven't even read it yet. <laughs> quantity and patient income, quality assurance or assessment and performance improvement, quality analysis and patient incidents, or quit asking people's issues. So you just pick. <laughs> Just pick your answer and then you uh, press submit. Okay. Not fooling anyone with quit asking people's issues, apparently. <laughs> I actually kind of like that better. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I always have way too much fun with these and I am always like. You're good at these. Doing the most over here. So yes, six responses. So yeah, we got uh, correct. 100% of Yay. people got it correct. Quality assurance or assessment depending on your industry and performance improvement. Okay, so really quick, bit. really quick. Mike yeah. is asking, would discharge planners be impressed agencies are tracking KPIs? I think so. I think, um, you know, um, especially those locations who get a lot of heat uh, like we were talking about from rehospitalizations, you know, if that comes back on their practice and they're a referring physician, uh, if there's certain, you know, uh, things that the primary physician ha keep has to keep going back to the hospital to admit that patient, you know, they get heat for that. And so, yes, I think um, from my experience, this helps with referral relationships um, because you can speak to the areas that are pain points for them a lot of the time. If you pay attention to what those pain points are and what the questions they ask you, you can build that into your quality indicators and track those things okay. that affect the community as well. Thank so you, I think Mike. so. Nice question. Yeah. All right. So I answered the second one. Good. Are you supposed to like cheap? Yeah, they you can. Okay. Yeah, you can. Okay. I didn't know if we'd have time to do the whole thing on this one or if we should break it into the second one or. Yeah, we can. We, okay. I don't know how many questions there are. I think there's eight. Okay. I think there's eight total. So who should be involved in quality activities? That would be, did everybody answer it? We've got four responses so far. So only the governing body and ownership, all staff licensed and non-licensed, friends and family, or just administration and management. And we've got, looks like we've got four answers already. And they're all correct. All staff licensed and non-licensed can and should be included in QAPI. And they will ask staff 
those type of questions as well. So they want to know that everyone is included in um, what initiatives you're doing. That doesn't mean everyone has to attend the meeting. Don't get the meeting and the idea of quality assurance. They're not the same thing. The meeting is just when you discuss the, the information that you've gathered. And then you can take those minutes, you can put them on a share drive if there's nothing confidential in there. If you have any type of um, employee information in there, often you know we track turnover as an administrative indicator for mm -hmm. QAPI yeah. um, or retention and recruitment. If you have any kind of sensitive information that you're tracking, um, you know, allegations and abuse, you can track those. Um, you just want to be really sensitive of if, if you share that with the whole team. So um, many people don't share the copy minutes yeah. and they keep those separate and they don't share those with surveyors unless they're specifically asked. I would recommend that. I would recommend only, I would not, not recommend sharing your logs or making those um, easily accessible for anyone. Um, I would recommend you only provide those when asked because those any quality assurance activities are for the internal process improvement uh, only. And I put that on all my forms. I put mm -hmm. that, I let my staff know that this is all confidential um, for quality assurance only. Okay. Which is not a QAPI initiative for home care. So um, monitoring compliance with required in-services, reducing unplanned return to hospital, tracking infections, trending falls, injuries, and accidents, or all of these are options for initiatives. And they all are options. So you can monitor, uh, it does seem like that's a, that's a trick question. So you can <laughs> monitor your compliance with re required in-services. You can monitor, um, any type of staff related benchmarks or indicators as your administrative PI area. So you can say we had, you know, one staff member who did not complete their OSHA bloodborne pathogens and here's how we're going to correct that. Um, so they don't necessarily tell you, no, you cannot do this topic. I mean, I'm sure if you picked something that was, you know, how many phone calls did we get on a Monday versus a Friday? Would they say that's a, a care service area? Probably not unless there was a negative outcome from that. So um, which situations are reportable instances for PI purposes? So I put for PI purposes because um, when I say reportable incidences, sometimes you think like, oh, to state or to CMS, but this is just something that you would report for quality purposes. A patient falls, but no one sees it, and the family member tells your staff? Yes. A patient calls the office uh, and says a staff member was physically rough during care? Yes. A family member swears at your sitter and tells her to leave? Uh, you could. You could report that to Quapi um, if you put that in your incidences. I probably don't. That's probably more of a customer service um, area for me unless that resulted in a threat where they said, I'm going to kill you if you don't leave here, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and some, if, a, if an adverse effect didn't come from it, then I probably would include it. Um, a patient smoking with oxygen is burned on the face and arms and sent to the ER. Absolutely. A patient's equipment malfunctions and results in a serious injury. Absolutely. A medication setup error results in a patient taking three times their blood thinners. Absolutely. That's <laughs> so those um, are, are all areas that are reportable for PI purposes. And the only one I would say is an exception is that a, a family member swears at your sitter and tells them to leave. Unless there was a, a threat, I probably wouldn't say that that's, that's an, a reportable incident. Those are good. We are required to report infections for both employees and patients. That is true. Only a nurse can report an injury. False. Anyone can report an injury. Only a nurse can uh, treat it or do an assessment. How can we show collaboration of care for PI? 
discuss any changes with the patient's care team, whether that be their physician and family nurse uh, in general, therapy, um, document patient and caregiver phone calls, provide updates to the plan of care, or by using an EMR. So another trick question there, you can use all of these areas to show collaboration of care. So the one that I would say is uh, not necessarily as far as accrediting bodies. If you say, well, we use an EMR, mm -hmm. they're gonna say, so what? <laughs> you didn't put a note in there that this happened. Um, so using an EMR doesn't necessarily show collaboration of care uh, like the other areas do, but you can show collaboration of care using an EMR. And how do you feel about Quapi now? So awesome or so lost? So does that mean 80%? Oh, so awesome. Okay, good. I was worried. <laughs> <laughs> so we're 78% on the way to 100% of That's so good. awesome. That's really good. Like, I'm, I'm proud of everybody because, I mean, for the non-medical people, yeah. it's yeah. so new. It's just, yeah, yeah it's. And, and it it's, can it's feel important. like a lot. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, great. 77. Hey, 81%. That's, really That's pretty good. So I want that to tell everybody, survey. before I forget, if you want to get a hold of Nina, I'm going to put her email in the description of the Facebook yeah. event. Absolutely. So usually I have a banner up here, but I was bad. I was really busy today. <laughs> I didn't get it done. No problem. But, um, let me look at your website. So it's hearthealthcaresolutions.com. If yep. you want to. And I do have... If you have something you can pull up, I can share it. Sure. I like, have pull up your website, and I think I can okay. probably share it. Awesome. I don't know if I can do it online. Well, I wanted to give you the link. If somebody wanted to look through what's in the pack, yeah. you can always um, ask me. But I am also happy to. Um, there you go. Can you see that? Okay. Yep. Okay. Nice. So I do have um, the Quapi for Home Care pack in here, which is what we were looking at. Um, and I think it's the newest one. So this has all of the tools that we were looking at um, for download in there. So all those items we shared on the screen, you can also see they're just not all listed down here. Um, and those are all just documents that you would download for yourself. Here's what's in it. Quapi policy, that's, program plan, audit tools that's a good and work. Price. I haven't actually seen that, but that's good. Tracking logs, the PI includes the PI coordinator job description for you, um, which obviously, like I said, you want to you want to go in, download these and change anything that doesn't fit your culture, your agency, and make sure that that's going to match what you're going to have them do. Um, so there's nothing that says what they have to do. They just have to be a PI coordinator. They have to be over your program. Uh, so they would manage the program for you. So that, that's all included in there. It's all downloads. You download so, all of it. Um, it's going to save a lot it. of time. And it really gives direction, it seems like. Yeah. Um, so, And I'm happy to answer any questions about it as well if there's something that's particularly challenging or unclear yeah. unclear to you. If you get that pack and you get stuck, I'm here. I'm here for troubleshooting. I'm here for suggestions uh, as well. So. So Sonia said, thank you. Very educational. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks, Sonia. And we have another one. Woohoo! Awesome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's really nice. So we're going to have a part two. So in part two, are we going to um, kind of dive in more to actually how to write? Yeah, we'll absolutely. Like so in part two, yeah, we'll talk about how to write your PIP and okay. what a PDSA cycle is. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. So anyone who has signed up for this webinar is going to get an email with the link so you can watch it later. It's also going to replay Saturday at noon. You're going to get really sick of us. <laughs> <laughs> and then next Tuesday, same time, because Nina's in Hawaii. Yes. Thank you guys for accommodating my schedule. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that's why it. We're, that's why we're replaying it at noon on Saturday. Yes. <laughs> um, right. So next Tuesday at 7, and then that one's going to replay Friday at 3.30, but you'll see all that online. So if you have any questions, you can always Facebook direct message me or um, 
go to Nina's website. You can find her email address there or in the yep. description of the Facebook event. Absolutely. Can always email so me. Heart Healthcare Solutions. Yep. That's and it's just Nina at Heart Healthcare Solutions. So oh, well, that's easy. I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you or so much. If I, if you have any, uh, I love to have a uh, challenging discussion. So if there was anything that I, you felt like was not correct. Let's let's look at it and <laughs> pull up the regs and I, uh, you know, uh, redact my <laughs> That's awesome. statement because there's always different differing opinions on what uh, what the regs mean or say. Yeah. So I love having those discussions too. Well, most people here actually know how to get in touch with me. If you can't find Nina, just email me uh, any questions and I'll make sure that they get to her. All right. Thank Nina, you so thank much, you. Robin. Oh. Thank you guys. Yeah, we got one question. Okay. Monica. When is part two? Next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Thanks, Monica. All right, Nina. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Bye, guys. You Thanks so much. Bye, everybody.